It's Pentecost Sunday. As you might anticipate, I'm going to take you to the second chapter of the book of Acts. Now, I'm not going to ask you to stand this morning because I'm going to be reading a little bit more than what I normally read, but nonetheless, we will certainly honor God's Word in our hearts. I'm going to read from Acts chapter 2, and we'll read the first seven verses, and then I'm going to skip around a little bit, but I will, I will guide you as we go. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Luke, he goes on in the next few verses and he begins to talk about the different regions that the people have come from. And he names, that, he names the regions that probably represent at least 15 different languages there. And now this man by the name of Peter, the one that just not too long before this at the trial of Jesus, he had stood there and he denied that he even knew Jesus. Now this man, a new man in Christ Jesus, he is going to stand and he's no longer denying him, but he is declaring him. In verse 14, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. Verse 16, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the next few verses there, Peter, he begins to let them know that that which they have witnessed that day, it wasn't something that just happened but rather this was something that Joel prophesied would happen hundreds of years before. Then in verse 21, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yeah. Verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, verse 38, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 39, For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And finally, verse 41, Then they that gladly received His word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. May the Lord add His blessings to the Word. Now today, as we said, it's Pentecost Sunday. I was driving down, I think it was, well, I was driving somewhere the other day, and anyway, I passed a Presbyterian church, and they had a special sign out, and it said, Come and worship with us or come and worship on Pentecost Sunday, or celebrate is what it said. Come celebrate Pentecost Sunday with us. Now our church is Pentecostal by denomination for whatever that is worth, but I suspect that most of the Christian denominal churches are going to be talking today about the day of Pentecost. Now, some of them may suggest that it was a one-day phenomenon that, that took place on that particular day. Others will probably say that it was a certain dispensation of time, a time in which the Lord moved on a temporary basis there in the New Testament era. Others will probably go behind the pulpit today and not know quite sure what to say about the day of Pentecost. But for those of us of the Pentecostal denomination, and don't 
think for a moment it is just us, but those that believe as we do, they will say that it was more than just something that happened during a day. It was something more than just happened in a limited dispensation of time. But we will stand and we will say that it is an ongoing experience because we know that verse 39 says, for the promise is unto you and is to your children and it's to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. I want to talk to you today about full Pentecost. Full Pentecost. Now when I say full Pentecost today, I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking about a particular time on the Christian calendar or a particular time in history. I am not speaking of a particular church denomination. I am speaking about an experience in God that becomes our way of life. I am talking about something that comes and happens within us that has the power to change our life forever, not only in this world, but in the world to come. Now in our scripture text that we shared this morning, the Bible talks about the day of Pentecost. And this was a day, it was a Jewish festival. It came 50 days after the, the Passover. Now after the Passover, there began a period of seven weeks. This was called the Feast of Weeks. And at the end of the Feast of the Weeks, the next day was Pentecost. And it was customary for the Jews that they would travel. Multitudes of Jews would travel from the various regions as we read a while ago and, and they would come to Jerusalem for the keeping of the Passover. Many of them would remain there until Pentecost. And that's why that we have so many different languages that were represented there that day because they had remained. They Excuse me, they had traveled from the different regions and they had remained there until Pentecost. But on this particular day, on this particular Pentecost, it was going to become more meaningful than any Pentecost had ever been before. This was the day that they had been waiting for. Last week I talked to you about waiting. And I talked about how that it is important for us to wait upon the Lord. I said it's important that we would wait patiently. I said that we needed to make sure that we waited in the right place, talking about the sanctuary of God. And then I finally said that we needed to make sure that we had waited long enough. Well, these folks had waited long enough. This is what they had been waiting for. You see, Jesus had spoke to them back there in the 24th chapter of the book of Luke and in verse 49. And, and Jesus, He was getting ready to ascend up into heaven. And, and He told them, he, he, was, he was talking to them about, I'm getting ready to bring my physical ministry that's on earth. I'm getting ready to bring it into, to an end. But He told them, He said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So this was the time. This was the time that mankind had been waiting for for hundreds of years. This was the day that the 120 had went to Jerusalem and now they had been waiting for about 10 days. And now the time, the Bible says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Pentecost had fully come. It was the time that they had been waiting for and on this particular day was going to be the birth of the New Testament church. The birth of the New Testament church. The New Testament church. The church age in which you and I are living in. It was birthed in the Holy Ghost. If you prefer today, the Holy Spirit. Now, I'll just say today that, that there's some that, you know, among the church world that is uncomfortable with the term Holy Ghost. They prefer Holy Spirit. And for those, that is fine with me because the Bible refers using both terminologies. So, so I don't, you know, it, it 
doesn't bother me. Some, when they say Holy Ghost, it says that it, it leaves them with somewhat of an eerie feeling because, it, you know, because ghosts are, are normally associated with the presence of someone that has died before. I got thinking about that and I thought, well, okay. I can accept that because you see John chapter 14 when Jesus was talking to them again about him going away in verse 18 he says I will not leave you comfortless he said I will come to you in verse 19 yet a little while and the world seeth me no more but ye see me because I live ye shall live also in verse 26 he says but the comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You see, the Holy Ghost, this ghost that we're talking about, it is Jesus Christ. And guess what? He did die. He did die and He rose again. And He is living. There is a presence. And guess what, folks? It's living within us. So you see, if you really want to talk about the Holy Ghost, I mean, if you really want to talk about the presence of someone that once died, I will tell you, we're talking about the right thing. We are talking about Jesus Christ dwelling within us. But let me tell you something about the Holy Ghost. The the Holy Ghost is not one to spook us. He is here to give us comfort. He is here to give us peace. He is here to empower us. So the Holy Ghost is nothing to be afraid of. The Holy Ghost is something for you and I to embrace. Now I want you to hold on to your hats this morning because I'm getting ready to tell you something that is going to help define what a lot of the problems are in a lot of the churches today. Now I have never said this in 32 plus years of ministry before, but I will tell you what the problem is with a lot of churches, there are too many ghostbusters around. Now, I, 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 you just just bear with me. Excuse the excuse the reference to the movie title this morning. But what I am saying is, there is a lot of people that do not understand who the Holy Ghost is and how He works, and and therefore they're. They're intimidated by the moving of the Holy Ghost. Now, too often this scare, this 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 fear, or this this being scared, this intimidation, it try it, it it sort of encourages them to try to get rid of the Holy Ghost. They call in the Ghostbusters, if you please. Now, I will tell you, the Holy Ghost this morning, he is nothing to be feared. He is nothing to be intimidated by. He is here to minister unto us. He is here. Jesus told them, He said, don't let your heart be troubled. You don't have to worry just because I am going away as far as this physical presence. He said, I will come again and I will be in you. I mean, He is here to help us, folks. We need to embrace the Holy Ghost today. I believe like we have never embraced Him before. I believe we need to let the Holy Ghost minister unto us. I believe we need to let the Holy Ghost minister through us in a manner like we have never ministered before. I will tell you that there are people that are scared of the moving of the Holy Ghost because it's something new to them. I, I, I respect that. But I also want them to understand. I want them to understand that Jesus is wanting to minister unto us. And there is a ministry that will not be possible other than through the Holy Ghost. Because that is the manner in which the Lord chose to minister unto us after He ascended into heaven. Now there is a yet another reason why some people want to get rid of the Holy Ghost, if you please. And may I just be very blunt with you this morning. It's because they don't want to be holy. There's some people today, they want to be religious, but they don't want to be holy. 
I thought about this as I shared in our dedication service this morning. Peter in 1 Peter 1 and verse 16. Peter wrote, he said, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. I will tell you that God is a holy God. And He has always desired to have a holy people. Genesis 1 and verse 27 says, So God created man in His own image. In the image of God created He Him. Male and female created He them. Do you realize that mankind was made in the image of a holy God? Do you understand this morning that our breath was initiated by a holy God? God breathing holy breath into us and we became living creatures if we are made in the image of a holy God even our breath by the holy God I will tell you I am convinced that mankind was designed to be holy creatures but then man sinned man sinned man disobeyed God and in doing so I believe they surrendered that holy nature now not only did that hurt mankind, but it is all I believe it also hurt God. Because God always desired, God always desired a holy people. That is why, again, as I said earlier, that multiple times in the Old Testament we can read about where God, as in Leviticus 20 and verse 7, where He said, Sanctify yourselves therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Many times He said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Our holy God has always desired a holy people. But I will tell you something about people. People have a tendency to mess up. Can anybody say amen this morning? There's just something about this human nature. I'll tell you what it is about this human nature. This carnal flesh is enmity against God. This carnal nature, it fights against God. It doesn't want the holy things of God. Not this carnal flesh. And so the Lord in His desire to have a holy people, guess what? And he came up with the perfect solution. He said, I put the Holy Ghost within them. I will give them a chance to become the holy people that I have called them to be by me, a holy God, coming and setting my abode up within them through the power of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost will live within us church the Holy Ghost will lead us the Holy Ghost will guide us the Holy Ghost will strengthen us the Holy Ghost will empower us to be the holy people that God desires us to be Romans 8 verse starting with verse 1 says there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Verse 5 says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The Holy Ghost wants to come into us and He wants to do a ministry. A ministry that will allow us to come into that state where there is now, therefore now, no condemnation. According to the Apostle Paul. But I'm going to tell you something. It's a very sad day. It's a very sad day when you can go to the churches and you can find people who want to be religious, but they don't want to be holy. Because God is calling us to be a holy people. He is not asking us to do something that we are not capable of doing. He said, I will help you. I will come to you. I will be in you. And I thank God today for the Holy Ghost. Now I will tell you that there are some of us who that we want to be the people. We want to be the holy people that our holy God has called us to be. And we found our solution to be just as Jesus designed it to be. It's through the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, just because that we once surrendered our life to the Lord, to the degree that He could and that He would come and dwell within us through the power of the Holy Ghost, that does not mean that we'll never struggle again. Can anybody say amen? I, I, I mean, just because 
that we have been filled with the Holy Ghost. Just because that we have spoke with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance doesn't mean that we will never have to struggle again. Now, I will tell you that in order for you and I to be the people that God has called us to be, for us to be, to have the victory that God wants us to experience, it is not going to take something more than just a promised Pentecost. In other words, I'm talking about it's going to take more than just something that we can foresee in our future if we want the victory that God has called us to have. It's going to take more than just a historical Pentecost. We can't just stand here today and talk about, well, what happened in the days of the early church, in the birth of the church. We cannot even talk about what happened the night that we surrendered our lives to the Lord and He came and He filled us with His precious Holy Ghost. I'm talking about full Pentecost today. I'm not just talking about the promise. I'm not just talking about history. I am talking about that which is dwelling within us right now, full of spirit, full of power. I am talking about a current. I am talking about a present experience of being full of the Holy Ghost. Now I want to tell you, the Holy Ghost is so empowering. Let me just, let me demonstrate to you just how powerful that the Holy Ghost can be in us. In James chapter 3, James, he he begins to talk to us uh, about the tongue. Let me just sort of summarize this for you. He said the tongue. He said it's a, you know, he, he said it's a, it, it's a small member of our body, yet he lets us know that it's very powerful. He begins to compare it to a horse. Now, I read that a riding horse, it weighs somewhere between one between 1,000 and 2,000 pounds. I, I, I even I wanted to make a point. I, I, I wanted to look at California chrome, and I wanted to try to find out how much California chrome weighed. By, by the way, it didn't, didn't win the, the triple crown, but in, in case you hadn't heard, but in case you cared, I don't know if you did or not. But, but I, I was just curious how much you know, California chrome may have weighed. I couldn't find it anyway. But, but they say the average riding horse weighs between one and 2,000 pounds. But James said that as great as that animal is, as strong as that animal is, you can control it by putting a bit in its mouth and you guide that horse. You tell that horse when to stop. You tell him which direction to go. And then he turns around and he begins to compare the tongue unto the rudder of a great ship ship and how that even though that in comparison is such a small thing but yet it will direct the direction in which that ship will go and then he begins to compare it to a fire a fire that can give such great destruction and then in verse 6 he says and the tongue is a fire a work of iniquity so is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on on fire the course of nature and it is set on the on fire of hell now i want to say something today and i i hope you'll understand the manner in which i am using this i'm not swearing today but i have heard people in swearing say holy hell may i just tell you there is no such thing. I will tell you that hell has never seen a holy day and it never will. I will tell you that we're going to have to make up our mind whether we want to be holy or whether we're willing to take hell. Just as Brother Anthony said today, there is a choice. It is one or the other. There is no such thing as the combination. Or oh, one of the writers, he said, how is it that some will try to bless God and curse man even with the same time? He said, this thing ought not be. It's got to be. And, and so, so James here, he talks about the tongue. And he talks about how that it is set on fire even by hell. But I'm going to tell you something about the power of the Holy 
Ghost. On the day of Pentecost, the Lord came in and He changed that. You know what He did? He took control of the most unruly member of our body. He took control of that member of our body that is set on fire of hell and Jesus said, ain't no more, not in the Holy Ghost. He said, I will take that tongue. And the Bible tells us that on the day of Pentecost, the people there, they began to speak in a language that was unknown to them. And in doing so, they began to declare the mighty works of God. You see, full Pentecost is the experience that birthed the New Testament church. And I will tell you, it's the same experience that will keep the church alive and keep it well. We need the Holy Ghost today. We need the Holy Ghost. We need it in our lives. It doesn't need to be a one-time experience or something that we got a long time ago. I will tell you, the Holy Ghost needs to have us today. The Holy Ghost needs to have us today. I said earlier that in spite of, of us having received the Holy Ghost, that we may still experience struggles in our life. Some of you amen to me, so apparently I'm not alone. There are times that if you're like me, we don't say the right things. Now, one of the reasons that we may not say the right thing is because we may not feel the right way in our heart toward a certain person or toward a certain thing, toward a certain circumstance. And therefore, guess what, folks? If we don't have the right thing in our heart, we're not going to have the right thing coming out of our mouths. Because the Bible says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so we cannot expect the right thing to come out of our mouth unless the right thing is in of our heart. Some of us may be able to relate to the time when our heart was so very strong toward the things of God. And yet there may even be some of us that we can also relate to the times when the things of God was not given the proper priority. There may have even been times that we gave full priority even to the things of the flesh. Or at least we gave the flesh a whole lot more attention than what we should have. The fourth chapter of the book of Acts, I, I, I want to share with you a couple verses there, but before we get into that, let me just take you back for a moment to the third chapter of the book of Acts. There you'll remember that Peter and John, they were going up to the temple to pray, and there was a man there that was crippled, and he was out there and he was asking alms, he was, he was asking for money. Remember Peter and John, they said, silver and gold have we none. But such as we have, give we thee and unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And, and the Bible tells us that the Lord healed the man. He got up, he went into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Now I will tell you, the people inside the temple, they knew. They knew what the state of this man had been. And so when they saw the miracle that had taken place, I will tell you, Peter and John, they had a very attentive audience that day. They wanted to hear what was going on. And so the Bible tells us that they begin to preach Jesus Christ. They begin to preach the resurrection of Jesus. Now when the religious leaders, when they heard this, they went and they got Peter and John and they put them in prison. And now they are waiting for the next day where they're going to have a hearing. And on the next day, the high priest and his family, the, the ones that sits in authority with them, they are going before them for a hearing. And on this hearing day, in verse 7, And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. What Peter was doing here, he was speaking, but he spoke only when that he was full of the Holy Ghost. I looked at that. I looked at that. And I thought about how that the Lord had told them. It's recorded in Luke chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto the magistrates and the powers, take ye no thought 
of what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to to say. Now as I begin to read this this week, I, I really I, I have to confess to you, I find it a little bit humorous. Peter and John they were there, they were preaching Jesus Christ. The religious leaders, they heard they went and they put them in prison. The next day, they're, they're before the high priest there on their hearing. And guess what? The Holy Ghost came upon them and look at what they did. They began to preach Jesus. The same thing that they were put in jail for, they began to do it again. I, I, I just, when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, Folks, you just got something about Jesus. Just something about that power that is within you that it just has to come out when the Holy Ghost moves us like the Holy Ghost wants to move us. Now, considering the miracle, the notable miracle that had happened, and they could not deny it, they had to let them go. The Bible tells us that when they let them go, they went back. Look at this in verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. They went back and they told their own company what had happened. Verse 31 says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Now, did you catch the first verse there of this, of this in verse 23? It said that when they let Peter and John go, they went into their own company. Now, who this own company was, the, the Bible doesn't specifically give us names or anything, but I suspect that these were people that had been filled with the Holy Ghost before. May have very well been those that, or at least some of those uh, that were among the 120 on the day of Pentecost. Maybe, maybe it was some of the 3,000 that was added at by the end of the day of Pentecost. But they had went unto their own company. They told them what happened. And then they prayed and the place was shaken. And the Bible says that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. May I just say this morning that just because you were once filled may not mean that you're always going to be full. Just because you were once filled may not mean that you're always going to be full. I got up at 2.30 this morning. One of the first things that I did was I made a pot of coffee. Now, the pot of coffee on it, it's got a mark, it says 12 cups. I will tell you, Gary does not make 10 cups. He does not make 8 cups. If the thing will let me make 12 cups, I make 12 cups of coffee. And when I made, when that coffee ran through there, I went back in there and guess what it said? It said 12 cups. I will tell you that when Shawanda got up, it no longer said 12 cups. Gary happened. I will tell you that something happened to that coffee pot between the time it was filled the first place and when she got up. I did purposely leave her enough for one cup, but that's probably about all that she got. I'm just here today to say that just because that we were once filled doesn't mean that we're always going to be full. Now, I, I, I thought about this, and, and, and maybe you can relate to this. Have you ever been around certain people or have you ever went through certain circumstances or certain situations that it just seemed that you could feel yourself being drained I mean some people just it, it just seems to have a tendency to be able just to just just to pull you down well I'm going to tell you something folks anytime that something happens to where that we're not as full as what we used to be guess what we need to do we need to get filled up again the Bible tells us that when they prayed the place was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Ghost now I thought about that and I'm, I'm closing. Galatians chapter 2. Now we read about what Peter did when he was filled with the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. He preached a powerful message. 3,000. About 3,000 were added into the church on that day of Pentecost. 
when Peter spoke after he was filled with the Holy Ghost. When he stood before the council for his hearing that day, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. And he spoke as the Holy Ghost led him to speak. But may I suggest to you that just because that on those two occasions that Peter were, was filled with the Holy Ghost, it may not have always been that way. Galatians chapter 2 verse 11 says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, Paul is writing here, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain men came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Peter can stand before the religious leaders and he can be in full of the Holy Ghost. He can speak with boldness. But now he gets up there among Christian believers that were of the circumcision and he begins to get intimidated and he becomes hypocritical in his actions. And Paul said, I withstood him to his face because he was to blame. Now folks, I'm going to tell you something. Any time that we're acting under the full power of the Holy Ghost, we're not going to do wrong. Any time that the Holy Ghost is leading us in what we do and what we say, there's not going to be any room for blame. I'm just here today to tell you that just because that we were once filled with the Holy Ghost doesn't mean that we're just going to skate right on through and never have to experience anything more in our life. This needs to be an ongoing experience. It needs to be an everyday experience with us. It's not enough just to be filled. We need to stay full. We need to stay full. I believe I could, if I may use Paul's terminology when he was writing to Timothy, I think sometimes we've got to stir up that gift. I think sometimes we're just going to have to stir up that gift that is within us. Paul talked about that gift that was in Timothy that he received by the laying on of his hands. I will tell you, I thank God for the gift of the Holy Ghost. But I've seen times in my life where I needed that gift stirred up. I've seen times in my life when I needed a stirring. Pentecost. Pentecost. The experience of of Pentecost, the pouring out, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, it birthed the New Testament church. It birthed the New Testament church. And it is going to take the working of the Holy Ghost to keep the New Testament church alive and well. I thank God for Pentecost this morning. I thank God for Pentecost. Now, Luke, Luke was a historian. And he wrote to us about the day of Pentecost from a historical account. But I would venture to say that the vast majority of us today, we have such a historical moment in our life. That time in which we were filled with the Holy Ghost. But my question is, have we stayed full? Have we stayed full? God help me not to settle for a one-time experience. God help me not to settle for a 27-time experience if that 27th time was in my past. It needs to be a current experience. The Holy Ghost wants to lead us. The Holy Ghost wants to guide us. The Holy Ghost wants to empower us. The Holy Ghost is wanting to fill our mouths. There was a time when they were asked, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, well, we haven't even heard about the Holy Ghost. Well, do you need to? You need to. The Bible says they preached and then they were filled. Folks, we need the Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Ghost. I wish, I wish that every church every pastor would be standing and telling their congregations today that they need the Holy Ghost. Now, may I tell you this, and I don't mean this in an ugly sense. I do not mean this in a critical sense. 
I do not mean it in denominal bashing this morning. But there are churches, there are pastors that will stand behind pulpits this morning. And they will declare unto the congregation that they need the Holy Spirit. They will declare unto the congregation that they need the Holy Ghost. But they, they don't talk about the power. They don't talk about the power of what the Holy Ghost is really wanting to do in our lives. Folks, it's something that we cannot be the people that God has called us to be without the Holy Ghost. That's why Paul would write to us in Romans. And he'd say, so if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, somebody finish it. None of his. None of His. God is calling us to be a holy people because He is a holy God. And yet it is nothing that we can do on our own. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? If you haven't, you need to. You need to. Peter preached to them on the day of Pentecost. And he told them just as it was. He said, you, with wicked hands, you have went and you have crucified the Lord of glory. He didn't, I mean, folks, he didn't sugarcoat that thing. He didn't sugarcoat it. And he, he, he told them just the way it was. And Peter was done. He, they said, what can we do? What shall we do? Men and brethren, verse 36, what shall we do? Is there any hope for us? We are not going to deny that which we have done. Yes, Peter, if you'll allow me to paraphrase, we have done exactly what you said that we have done. Okay, yeah, we did it ignorantly. We didn't understand, but yet we still did it. Is there any hope for us? Well, sure there is. Sure there is. I had prepared, before I learned of Nathan and Samantha allowing us to dedicate the baby today, I had prepared a Sunday school lesson. and I was going to talk to you about the cities of refuge. and We'll talk about it at another time. But I thank God there is a refuge for us. And there was for those on the day of Pentecost as well thing that we can do? Sure there is. You can repent. You can turn. You can cha have a change of heart. You can have a change of mind. You can turn. You can be baptized. How? In the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Our only hope to stand before a holy God and not be turned away on the day of judgment is to be a holy people. And for us to be a holy people, it's not something we can do on our own. We need the Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Ghost. This altar is open.